So welcome everybody. Um, it's just past the hour. This is the last of the IAG's uh, regional webinars. This is the webinar for Western Europe. And uh, this year we've run 10 webinars in various regions uh, around the world. And so far um, I've been looking at statistics. So we're getting, a, you know, a good uh, amount of participation compared to previous years. This is the third year we have, the IAG has run the regional webinars. So we're delighted you could join us again. I noticed uh, a few uh, people in the audience uh, uh, I've been to of this year's, last year's and previous years, but any of those of you that haven't uh, been to these webinars before, essentially the idea is that we uh, consult the national scientific members of the IAG. So they're the national associations, the geomorphology groups on, in different regions of the world. And we ask them to provide us names of their brightest upcoming geomorphologists. And then uh, from their recommendations, we go out and invite and cons construct a program uh, uh, bringing together all those uh, different researchers and uh, so the idea is to give you a taste of the sort of things that are going on in, you know, the sort of research is going on in different areas of the world uh, in geomorphology. And so we're covering all sorts of topics from, uh, from desert geomorphology to, uh, to wetlands, to, to fluvial geomorphology, uh, glacial, periglacial, uh, all those kinds of things. And uh, I'm really excited about the program we've been able to put together. And I'm really happy that the, the, the people, that so many of the people we invited said, said yes uh, straight away. We had a few people say no because they're in the field. I think that's quite a good excuse. And some people said yes, even though they were in the field, which is fantastic. Uh, so I'm really pleased to have such a, a great program ahead of us. Thank you very much for having us to be uh, speaking here. My name is Helene Vos. I used to work at the University of Basel, but I actually moved this year to Stellenbosch in South Africa. But I'm still working on the project that I will present uh, right now, which is also in collaboration with the University of Cape Town. We started this project last year. We got some interesting results, but hopefully the future will uh, give us more opportunities to continue this research. And as a start, I would like to do a little recap on dust and why we're interested in dust. And that might be less of a relevant topic in Western Europe, but I still think it is a bit relevant because hopefully most of you can remember seeing these dust clouds traveling over the continent, which is uh, all dust coming from the Sahara. And the reason why dust is interesting is because it small but also generally very nutrient rich particles. So the emission of these particles, the transport and the deposition of nutrient rich particles can have big impacts. One important impact for the emitting area is that dust can play a role in land degradation because when nutrients are removed from a uh, land, it will of course lead to the depletion of these nutrients and fines. Dust can have both a cooling and a warming effect on climate. Generally cooling, uh, when there's dust in the air, it sort of reflects incoming light and it can promote cloud formation. But when dust settles on snow or ice, it can of course also uh, decrease the albedo. Dust plays a very important role in the global chemical flux, especially the feeding of nutrient poor region is an important uh, aspect of dust. One of these nutrient poor regions is the oceans. Dust deposition in the ocean can feed algae, which can then lead to more CO2 absorptions by these algae. But then dust can also have a negative health effect. The World Health Organization estimates that there are 2 million deaths per year from air pollution, and dust is part of that. And dust can carry, trend, can, uh, carry pathogens and allergens. So the exact effect of dust depends a lot on where it's coming from that determines the characteristic of the dust and where it's going. And that's why there's a general interest in understanding what surfaces are emitting dust and what factors uh, control this dust emission, right? 
So for this reason, there has been uh, dusty regions have been studied. Some uh, regions are understood better than others. And that brings me to the dust from the west coast of South Africa. The dust here has been observed by a study in 2017. And we can also observe it ourselves now if we look at this uh, beautiful satellite image. However, it has not been further studied. So we don't really know what kind of surfaces are emitting this dust and what's controlling this dust. And this is something that we wanted to address uh, with our project. Our aim was to identify the spatial and temporal variation of this dust emission and determine its controlling factors. That we identified the dust source points from 2000 to 2021 using MODIS satellite images, which is an example given on the right. So when we say dust source points, it means that we try, if we look at a dust plume like this, that you try to find where is the dust exactly coming from. It's not just one region where the dust is, where it's exactly coming from. And then we combine this data with meteorological data and uh, land use data and land cover data, which are achieved, uh, obtained by satellites. So let's have a look at the first results. So over the last 22 years, we found 569 dust source points. I showed them in the graph on the right. You can see that most dust comes from the a region very close to the coast and some more inland dust sources. Let me see if I can do a laser pointer. There you go. And if we look at the monthly variation, there's a dust season between April and September with sort of peaks in June and July. This is in South Africa, the winter. And then the middle shows the wind row of the wind conditions during these dust events. So there's general north to eastern wind. The northeastern winds can be linked to the so-called berg winds in this region. Berg winds means uh, mountain winds and Afrikaans. And these are winds, quite dry winds that blow from the interior of the continent to the coast. So we can see that there's, and these winds are very characteristic. They generally occur in the winter. So I have sort of winter winds that cause winter dust so far, it's quite um, normal, let's say. But then if you look at the dust source point counts per year, then we see something strange because up to, well, up to maybe 2016, it fluctuates a bit with no dust in uh, 2012. It goes up in 2017, but then in 2020 and 2021, there's a tripling in the amount of dust sources. The data shows a big increase in the dust source points over time. And when we see a big increase like that, there's sort of basically two explanations. Either it's a change in wind velocity, so there's more wind or there is stronger wind, or there's a change in the emissivity of the surface. So something's happening on the surface that causes this big increase in dust. Since I'm limited, in my time today, I will fast forward a bit and say that we did not see a significant change in the wind velocity. So this makes us think that there's something happening on these surfaces that causes big increase in dust. That gives the question, what types of surfaces are emitting dust and how did these surfaces change over time to give this increase? So as I said before, we would look at the land cover of the dust source points. We used the uh, land cover data set that is derived from Sentinel data. I gave an example of this, uh, or what this data set looks like on the, on the left. It's a very high resolution data set, so you might not see all the, all the details of it. But an important thing to see is that there's a big purple area, which are succulent Kuru shrublands. This is a very um, typical and very beautiful uh, biome in this region. And what we then did is look for all the dust source points, what the land cover is from the areas that they're coming from. While doing that wave of the results on the right, we see that most of the dust comes from shrubland areas, which is not a big surprise since this is such a prominent uh, land cover in the region. 
But second place goes to mining areas. There's a lot of mining going on on the coast. This is generally diamond mining and heavy mineral mining, such as uh, zircons. And there's a lot of um, dust coming from bare regions. These are regions that have very little to no vegetation and not are not really um, modified by humans, let's say. However, our question was, of course, what is causing this big increase in dust? So then we go back to the picture that we saw, or the graph that we looked at before with the dust source points per year, but then grouped according to the lens cover type. And what we saw is that uh, for 2020 and 2021, the biggest increase in dust uh, came from the succulent Karoo shrubland lens cover. This lens cover increased in a sevenfold in the amount of dust source points. There was also a doubling of the emission points from bare and mining surfaces. So this is very interesting. What made these uh, shrublands so emissive in the last two years? And we think that this is related to a drought that has been occurring from 2017 to 2021. The graph on the left shows the rainfall and the MDVI. In the last five years, there was a drought uh, which also leads to a um, sort of a decrease in average um, uh, and, I, sorry. and it's important to take into account that it's these consecutive years that for each year lead to less and less vegetation that destabilizes the soil. There's also grazing going on that I should mention, which could be of influence. There's a lot of uh, stock farming. And the reason why this drought is important is because uh, a further decrease in precipitation has been predicted by the IPCC. So this is not an exception. This can get uh, stronger over time. So the question is, will this develop as a more as a dust region? And there's also the loss of soil and fertility with this dust emission. So we should also wonder what the chances are for this land to recover, for the uh, vegetation to come back, let's say. So oh, these results, I think, raise more questions than they answer them. An important question is, of course, what about the dust from this, the mining dust? What about the influence on the ocean, etc.? So we submitted a research proposal on this topic, and then hopefully, if it gets approved, I uh, can give many more presentations on this topic. So thank you very much. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Jean-Philippe Bellia, and uh, I'm going to talk about coastal wetland adaptability to sea level rise, and specifically what are the relative impacts of semi-dional versus dional tides in driving this um, coastal wetland adaptability. So um, yeah, first of all, to give you a bit of context, um, as you may know, coastal wetlands like Tidal marsh and mangrove, they show a variability in the way they adapt to uh, sea level rise on the uh, global scale. Uh, so there are regions such as those two that I'm showing you on this global map that uh, are notable hotspots where these wetlands are already showing signs of submergence driven by sea level rise. But there are also other regions where these wetlands instead are able to uh, build their elevation at uh, rates that are equal or if not exceeding the rate of uh, relative sea level rise. And so identifying the factors that control this uh, global viability has been a, a long-standing topic of uh, great scientific interest. And previous studies uh, have shown that uh, this viability, viability sorry, is actually mainly controlled by uh, a few environmental conditions. So one is the rate of relative sea level rise itself. The other one is the suspended sediment concentration. So by that, uh, I mean the supply of sediment to the wetlands. Uh, and third is the tidal range. And speaking about tides, another important tide characteristic that varies on the global scale is the fact that tides uh, exhibit a variety of patterns worldwide, as you can see in this uh, global map. So patterns ranging from semi patterns 
uh, characterized by two tidal cycles uh, in about a day, a bit more than a day, all the way to diurnal pattern with only one tidal cycle uh, per day. And despite this feature of the tide is uh, uh, an apparent feature, it's a well noticeable feature. Uh, all these previous global scale assessments uh, that I've mentioned uh, did not consider this environmental condition. And so this actually led to the objective of our study, which was trying to, let's say, explore first and trying to potentially unveil uh, a role of the tidal pattern is driving this global variability in, um, in wetland adaptability to sea level rise. And so to answer this research question, uh, we used two approaches. So first we carried out a meta-analysis. So from the literature, we compiled data on observed rate of wetland elevation change uh, for nearly 400 sites um, scattered around the globe, as you can see, sorry, in this map. So this site comprised both tidal marsh and, uh, and mangrove. And uh, this wetland elevation change were obtained uh, by uh, the so-called surface elevation table, which is uh, uh, in the wetland community, a, a well-known, well-established, uh, like a standard uh, method to monitor change in elevation above mangrove and marsh uh, platform. And in addition to that, we also uh, retrieve values of this uh, global scale driver of wetland adap adaptability that I mentioned previously. So we first uh, derive the local rate of volatility level rise for every of the sites based on tide bulge records. Uh, the, um, let's say, suspended sediment concentration in the nearby waters, uh, so that uh, we actually obtain those from satellite imagery the local uh, tidal range, and lastly, our newly investigated factor, the uh, tidal pattern, which here we quantify using the form factor, uh, which, as you can see uh, in this slide, is the, the ratio of the, um, I will just use the laser pointer, so it's the ratio of the amplitude of the two main diurnal constituents over the uh, amplitude of the two main semi diurnal constituents. And then using some multivariate uh, statistical technique, we try to assess the relative influence of each of these predictors. And you can see that uh, the tidal pattern, yeah, despite being the least uh, important predictor, still explain around 20% of the wetland elevation change uh, globally observed. But now if you look at the so-called wetland elevation balance, which is uh, the rate of wetland elevation change obtained from this SCT technique minus the rate of relative sea level rise that you derive from tide gauge records. And that's a measure that really tells you whether or not a wetland can keep pace with sea level rise. You can see that this time the tile pattern uh, is the third most important predictor and with a relative influence uh, nearly as much as uh, that of the suspended sediment concentration. Uh, then to assess which of these tidal pattern actually coincide with wetland vulnerability to sea level rise. We looked at wetland with elevation deficits. So those are wetland for which the elevation gain is lower than the rate of relative sea level rise. And you can see that uh, those sites predominantly occur, uh, let's say, under uh, journal tides. So these first, let's say, uh, global observations indicate that the tile pattern is an important uh, determinant of this wetland elevation change and the balance with sea level rise. So then in a second approach, we carried out model simulation where we tried to further explore the uh, distinct effect of semi diurnal versus diurnal tides in driving uh, the sediment accretion response of a wetland, in particular marshes here. And here is the first set of results. Uh, you can see on the y-axis the so-called threshold rate of relative sea level rise for marsh survival. So that's, in other words, the maximum rate of sea level rise that a marsh can withstand. So above which it will convert into, yeah, bare tidal flat or open water, as a function of sediment concentration uh, and tidal range scenario. And you can clearly see some uh, relationships. So the higher the sediment concentration and tidal range is the higher the rate of sea level rise uh, the marsh can withstand. 
And that is a result for the case of semi-dural tides. Um, now, if I superimpose uh, the result for the case of the dunal tides, you can see that regardless of the scenarios of tidal range and sediment concentration, this predicted uh, threshold rate of relative sea level rise is consistently lower. So these tend to indicate that the marsh that are forced by dunal tides are actually less resilient to sea level rise. So why is that? Why do we get um, such results? Uh, if you look at the sediment dynamics, um, comparing that for marsh forced by semi dunal versus dunal tides, uh, for a time scale of, of a day, of a lunar day, so a bit more than a day, it's 24 hours and 50 minutes, uh, you can already get some insight into the mechanism at place. So basically, like a marsh that is forced by two semi dunal tides as compared to a marsh forced by one dunal tides during a lunar day will result in two versus one um, inundation events. And since each of these inundation events introduced high suspended sediment concentration that subsequently decreased because of the stepping of the sediment, these two semi dunal tides will result in a higher net elevation gain as compared to uh, the single dunal tides, even if uh, that dunal tide has a longer inundation uh, period. And so this indicates that dunal tides actually promotes lower sediment accretion than semi dunal tides and hence the reason why these marshes and mangroves caused by uh, dunal tides are, seem to be less resilient to sea level rise. So to conclude, uh, we have seen that the tidal pattern, uh, despite till now being an overlooked environmental condition, is actually an important driver of coastal wetland adaptability to sea level rise. Um, and actually through this explorative study, the aim was also to um, stimulate and encourage further research uh, because we believe that uh, this tidal pattern can also affect other key wetland ecosystem function and services such as those that are listed here because yeah, those processes, those services and functions, they are to some extent also regulated by the inundation regime of the tides. And uh, if you want to hear uh, and learn more about uh, these topics, uh, feel free to look at our latest uh, published paper on, on that matter. Voila. Thank you very much for your attention. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about the lower muse. And um, I think as, oh, does it work? Oh, it doesn't go yep. to the next step. Does it ah. go to the next slide? Ah, it does. Sorry. Uh, so as, as, as most of you probably know, um, the, the Muse catchment was hit by severe flooding about one and a half year ago. And um, well, a lot has been said about conditions, but um, what was expected before is that these type of floods wouldn't occur before the second half of, of the 21st century. Um, and they were also not, not predicted by our national flood forecast model. So um, Questions have been raised that is this already a rapid response to climate change and, and can we expect this, this more um, often to happen in the near future? And as part of our, our knowledge gap, so to say, um, that I think there is a necessity to, to study the fluvial archives for, for reference for, for periods of rapid climate change or also periods of uh, warming in the past. Um, so what we did is we looked at the catchment or well the, the reach of the lower muse which is uh, in the Netherlands and what we did there is we constructed a CPDF a cumulative probability density function what that is it is a summation of all the dates we could find that were taken in the fluvial context so every dated fluvial unit we gathered from literature mostly literature on fluvial geomorphology archaeological research but also recent flood management projects we grouped that data and we uh, added all the ages and their uncertainty ranges into a single summation. So that gives you a distribution of your dates uh, through time. And that will show you transient and uh, periodic changes in the formation of alluvial units. So there is a particular focus here on the trends during the Holocene of what changes the river system has gone through in the last 12,000 years. These are the results. Um, so, oh, I have to go back. So we have about 400, 
27 dates gathered in total. So these are, these are the results. And we grouped our data into three different uh, data sets. And those are a data set for classic dates, so dates that were gathered from uh, classic deposits, dates that were gathered from organic deposits, so peat, peat formation um, inside a fluvial context, so within the river floodplain, mostly concentrated in uh, abandoned river channels. And then we have a third group, which is distilled from both classic and organic dates, uh, and those are change dates. So those are the dates that identify major changes in the distribution of uh, sediment in the river valley. So they either identify a change from organic deposits to a classic deposits or the other way around. Um, now, if I go through that record uh, step by step, if we start by with the early Holocene, um, we see that there is very, very limited plastic deposition in the lower mu. So that's the, the orangey color there. So there's only limited periods where, where you can see that there is some active overbank deposition or any deposition at, at all. And that's mainly because the muse at that time is uh, very far in, entrenched in this valley. So we have the, 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 the end of the Younger Dryas period, and we go to the early Holocene, and we have a change in the river system from a braided system to a meandering system, which incises about three meters. So that causes when there is a flood or if there is high water that not much sediment is distributed along the valley. So all the river activity is constrained in a very narrow uh, space. Um, what we see though is, are fluctuations in organic content. And those are a bit surprising because they, they coincide very well with um, ice rafted debris events on the Northern hemisphere. So these are, Cool periods. So, for example, the pre-boreal oscillation, the 8.2 event pops up. And that's a bit surprising because normally, if you have a cooling in Western Europe, that's associating with relatively dry conditions. But here we have enhanced peat growth in our abandoned channels, which indicates that there is increased wetness around that time. Um, so this is a kind of conceptual representation of that, of, of what we think is going on uh, at that time, is that we might have slightly wetter conditions in the valley of the river because we have um, enhanced groundwater levels. And that might either be caused by a reduced uh, evapotranspiration by the cooler temperatures, or maybe also an enhanced um, flooding regime, and especially in spring, because most of the precipitation will fall as snow in a slightly cooler climate during the whole scene. Now, if we go to the mid and late Holocene, I group those, uh, we see a very clear trend here, and there's a very clear uptake in plastic deposits. And that has a lot to do with an increasing human impact on the catchment. Um, people start to clear forest and uh, first that, that comes apparent, apparent with the arrival of, of uh, early agriculturalists uh, a bit before 6,000 years ago. And around that time, we see a, an increase in the plastic dates. And there's a step up, it's about 4,000 years in the Bronze Age, and then again in the Iron Age, um, and especially a very large increase in plastic deposition in the medieval period. So you see here, it's a reflection of the increasing human disturbance in, in the uplands. So um, during the Bronze Age and Iron Age, there was this British technical innovations, which increased the erosion in the uplands, which delivered more sediment uh, to the downstream valley. And um, that became so, well, bad or so extreme that we even have a, a post-Roman valley fill. So from being an incising and trenched river system, the Meuse actually became a slightly aggrading river system by all that sediment which came down the system, which came from the hills first as colluvium and then entered the main trunk valley of the lower Meuse. Um, so, as in support of that, we have uh, vegetation reconstructions, uh, for example, from the Dyla catchment in northeastern Belgium. And you see it's quite consistent uh, uh, image that first there is a, a very slight disturbance of the catchments of the vegetation uh, around 6,000 years ago. And then from the Bronze Age, Iron Age onwards, uh, re things really start to kick off and you have a, um, a very active uh, mobile system. So a lot of sediment gets transported downstream and is deposited in the floodplains of the Lower Meuse Valley. 
Then there's something else I want to highlight here, and that's that's a weird, weird period. It's about 6,000 years ago, and that's that's the end of the mid-Holocene uh, optimum, relatively warm period. And uh, we have first a, a giant peak there in, in um, plastic deposition, followed by a large peak in organic deposition. Um, and that, that peak in organic disposition is, is coinciding also with uh, a lot of change dates. So that is much of these dates, many of these dates, are associated with a certain change in distribution of sediments across the valley. And what we think here uh, is the most likely explanation is, is that around this time, there was probably a major flood or a series of major floods, which caused a straightening of the river channel and causing many oxbow lakes to emerge. And so first, when that happens, you still have some deposition in these abandoned lakes, but after they become really well cut off and it's still wet enough and warm enough, you will st start to get peak growth. And that will have a delay probably of a few centuries before that is really disconnected from, from the main active river. Um, so I think those peaks in, um, plastic deposition followed by a peak in organic deposition, they are pretty much related to the same massive event. Uh, such events might be very interesting uh, to study further if we want to look at the effects of, of climate change and the really biggest flood events that can occur and which are probably most geomorphologically active. So the implications and conclusions from such uh, such a, a an overview is that well rivers are self archiving on their past. You can if you study them um, carefully, you can see all kinds of trends and evidence for high magnitude events uh, in the past. Um, and then CPDFs they can provide valuable insights in, in fluvial responses to perturbations. Uh, those can be climate change that can also be uh, human. Uh, disturbance to the system. But however, uh, CPDFs are still an, an, a combined signal. So they, they combine everything together. So we've seen evidence of, of entrenchment, degradation, um, impacts from climate change and human forces forcing. And then there's still research bias. So uh, for example, um, not shown here, but we have a lot of dates as well for the younger driest periods and period. And that's because a lot of researchers focus specifically on that period. So we have a lot of dated uh, fluvial units in those specific windows. Um, and then, well, the, the, the signal combines sediment fluxes, flood regime changes, and, and geomorph geomorphological changes as well. Um, well, our research showed that, that there is a strong anthropogenization of the catchment. Um, we have a change in flooding regime. So first we see only responses to cooling periods, but if you get Closer to present day, you can see that the river responds to all kinds of different perturbations. So in warm periods, you can have an amplified uh, uh, flooding regime, but also in cooler periods. Um, and the last, the figure that's, uh, that's on the right, um, there are some strong periodicities in the system. So for the last 4,000 years, but also during the earlier Holocene, we have a very persistent multi-centennial, so about 500 to 800 year cycle in uh, deposition, or well here, this one is non-deposition, so the peat growth. Um, and those are, are significant for very long periods. So that suggests that Although humans are have quite quite a strong an impact on on the river system, that there is still this cyclicity forced by climate change by the Atlantic climate system, which is still seen in in those patterns of of overbank deposition. Um, yeah, and and last, some key major geomorphological events, especially for flooding, can be targeted from such records, and that might provide um, further suggestions for further research to look at these events, when did they occur, that they occur in cooling periods, warm periods, or specific, spe specifically during periods of, of rapid climate change. And that could all underpin our, our coping with, with future climate changes as well. So that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So hi, everyone. My name is uh, Tara Bezanwaller, and I'm a postdoc at the University of uh, Tübingen. And today I will uh, present uh, a paper which focuses on uh, fluvial uh, records and how they can be used to address uh, questions related to climate fluctuation and water resources uh, during the Bronze Age period in the southern uh, Piedmont of uh, the Adjar Mountain. So a little bit of introduction first, uh, in Arabia, uh, climatic fluctuations alternate between uh, humid and arid period, and they are driven by uh, 
rainfall variability related to the intertropical conversion zones and uh, the position of the monsoon belt. And humid periods have played a significant role uh, in human uh, environment interaction, triggering uh, increasing rainfall, uh, fluvial lacustrine activity, and denser uh, vegetation cover. In Northern Oman, uh, in the Adjar Mountain, uh, the Holocene humid period lasts roughly uh, between uh, 10,000 uh, BP and 6,000 6, uh, BP. And the best uh, climate uh, record we have uh, for this period are the Speleothem from uh, the Ota Cave. Uh, but the problem is that there is a 2,000 uh, uh, year uh, hiatus in the Speleothem record. So exactly during the Bronze Age period, which is also a period when uh, long-term uh, settlement evidence of farming and uh, flood management and what we call uh, proto-oasis uh, first appeared in Oman. So the, this coincidence uh, raised a question about the adaptive uh, response from Bronze Age uh, society to aridification and a reduction of uh, water uh, resources. So water acquisition uh, in Oman today relies on groundwater, traditionally uh, through an irrigation system based on underground gallery called Palage. Uh, however, the first uh, uh, date Palage we have uh, is from the Iron Age, and it's still unclear uh, how Bronze Age society found uh, enough uh, water to grow crops and palm trees before. So we have two uh, hypotheses uh, to explain this uh, right now. So the first is that we maybe have uh, a short uh, pluvial period during the Bronze Age. And uh, the second one uh, involves uh, the use of uh, huge uh, ditches to collect water from rain and potentially uh, flood. So the ditches are those big excavation uh, you can see around the settlement. But uh, it's still difficult to precisely qualify uh, the hydric stress uh, Bronze Age uh, society faced and the amount of water uh, they have. So to, uh, to engage uh, this discussion, we need to uh, know uh, the timing of uh, the rainfall decreasing, the timing of the response of the hydro system, and uh, the timing of the onset of uh, surface water scarcity. And we have several issues for, for this is that first, uh, the speleothem from Ota Cave start growing uh, at uh, 300 millimeters per year. So we miss all uh, the data from period which are below uh, 300 millimeters per year, which is a lot in Oman, uh, of course. And uh, the second issue is the strong uh, rain, uh, orographic induced uh, rainfall gradient that exists between the high uh, mountain range and the low Piedmont. And uh, that uh, problem requires uh, local scale uh, studies. So regarding this need, um, fluvial archives are here very useful to reconstruct local uh, hydro system response to rainfall variability, but they are very rare in Oman. And so today I will present uh, the first uh, study on uh, late Quaternary Holocene uh, fluvial deposit we have uh, for my area, uh, which is uh, in the southern part of the Adjar mountain. Uh, so it's an area which currently receives uh, 70 millimeters uh, uh, of rainfall per year. And the Wadi, uh, we will study it called Wadi Disha, and it's a small uh, water course uh, which have a watershed of uh, 40 uh, kilometers square, and it takes its source in a mesa of uh, low uh, elevation. Our methodology of study includes geomorphological survey, production of map of uh, quaternary formation, Aerial and topographic survey realized by drone, uh, creation and treatment of uh, DM, uh, study of selected section, description of the sedimentary facies, and sampling for malacological analysis, uh, OSL dating, and uh, radiocarbon. The geomorphological survey saw that showed that the Wadi Disha uh, incised uh, an erosion glacis made of marl and three generations of alluvial accumulation were identified, uh, cut into a three terrace uh, level, so TA, TB, and TC. The highest uh, terrace stands four meters above the Wadi bed. The medium terrace uh, is 2.5 meters above Wadi bed, and the lowest one is 1.5 above uh, the Wadi bed. And uh, we made detailed analysis of uh, five uh, sections uh, to characterize and date uh, the alluvial infilling. In and for the uh, TA, we have a stratigraphic organization that uh, shows that the depositional system is mainly dominated by bread channel, and the section is divided in two parts. Uh, the base uh, dead back uh, to the late Pleistocene, so around 26,500 KBP, and the top 
uh, date back to the early Holocene, about 1,500 CalBP, so prior uh, the Holocene human period. And here, and uh, I, I will present all my age dating uh, mean CalBP uh, in the figure. Uh, then uh, the terrace body of TB level have been studied with uh, three uh, sections, TB1, TB2, and TB3. Uh, the lower uh, part of TB1 date back around uh, 6,600 CalBP, and the upper part of the section uh, date to approximately uh, 5,800 CalBP. And it's more nostalgically uh, because of the presence of this darker paleosoil uh, unit, uh, which contain uh, numerous uh, snail and uh, bioturbation. The assemblage of uh, mollusk of this section present only uh, two species, uh, the Tecus insularis, which need uh, shade to, to thrive, and uh, Pupoides conolepictus, which occur in river bank or uh, lacustrine uh, context. Uh, TB2 section is located within uh, the depositional uh, lobe of uh, a meander, and TB3 is in a paleo channel, and both sections uh, provide us evidence of an hydrosystem which is uh, gradually uh, losing energy, particularly between 5,800 uh, and 5,500 Calbic. The last uh, terrace level we have is TC, and for this one, we only have uh, one age dating, uh, about uh, 2,600, and the unit is mainly composed of disorganized uh, heterometric material. So by following the chronological marker we obtain, we can propose a schematic evolution for the Wadi Disha. Uh, so first, uh, a phase of incision of the glacier before uh, 26,500. Uh, then a phase of aggradation takes place between 26,000 uh, and 11,000, so between an arid period and the beginning of the Holocene. Uh, then uh, the base uh, of uh, TB, uh, the, the aggradation of TA is uh, followed by two meters of incision, and this erosional phase uh, coincides with likely the reactivation of flow dynamic during the Holocene uh, humid period. The base of TB accumulation is dated to the end of the Holocene humid period, so between 6,500 and 6,100 CalPP. And uh, its organization uh, suggests that the active channel move uh, gradually to the north and add uh, favor the development of silting area uh, in the distal uh, flood plain where many uh, mollusks uh, that like wet and uh, shady environment have uh, proliferated. And it also coincides with uh, paleo channel incision and filling between 5,800 and 5,600, so likely at the end of the Holocene uh, humid period. And then the TBT race is in size between 5,000 and uh, 2,600 BP, and around 2,600 BP, we have a last uh, alluvial accumulation characterized by a torrential deposit and the incision of TC uh, since begun and it's still uh, ongoing. So to sum up, we found three phases of uh, alluvial aggradation and four phases of incision. And the TB phase of aggradation occurred during the end of the Holocene uh, human period and was influenced by, uh, by a reduced rainfall, uh, which is evident about uh, 5,700 CalBP. And the TC level suggests uh, intense rainfall and detritic event, but we need uh, further data to, to confirm uh, this finding. So regarding the research question we mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, the study of Wadi Disha shed light on two important aspects related to hydrosystem during the Holocene humid period and the Bronze Age. So first, it, co it confirmed uh, that the lowland uh, area benefit uh, as well from water condition, leading to more regular flow and extended plain. Second, uh, also the, the end of the Holocene humid period is difficult to date accurately with fluvial archive. It is clear that uh, wadi flow uh, were considerably uh, less important at the beginning of uh, the early Bronze Age. So then um, regarding ditches from the Bronze Age, here we can see that the ditches phenomena happened many centuries af after the flow reduction, indicating that Bronze Age society did not benefit from a heavier uh, rainfall. So then it's improbable that Bronze Age ditches were advantageous to collect uh, surface water flow. And it's suspected that ditches were likely meant to collect water from uh, shallow groundwater that have been recently recharged uh, during the Holocene uh, humid period. So was uh, shallow groundwater the source of uh, the water collected uh, by the early Bronze Age uh, ditches? That's the question uh, of uh, the research project I am conducting uh, right now uh, in Oman. Uh, with the Umwelt Vandel project, so I hope we're going to have uh, more answer uh, in the coming year. And if you are, if you want uh, more detail about uh, the Wadi Disha evolution, please look at the paper uh, we published in a, 
euh, géomorphologie, processus, relief et environnement in uh, November 2022. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Um, my name is Amélie Duquen. I uh, will present you my uh, work uh, on uh, the evolutionary trajectory of a low energy river during the Holocene, the Sharon River between Angoulême and Sainte. The study of low energy rivers has long been neglected by geomorphology in favor of highly dynamic uh, streams. These systems are wrongly regarded as buoyed and unchangeable and have attracted limited scientific interest. This lack of interest is paradoxical because many ordinary rivers in the world belong to this category. These um, rivers are, this lack of interest Um, these rivers are associated to a specific trim power lower than 10 watts per square meter and a globally stable dynamic in short and midterm, excluding anthropic interventions. In the two recent decades, increased scientific attention has been paid to these rivers in connection of river res restoration. Indeed, the developments of navigation or the exploitation of hydraulic power have a major impact on these rivers because of their weak slope and lead to huge transformation of their shape and functioning. Knowledge on the functioning of this hydro system is still very incomplete, especially its process and adjustment capacity regarding climate change. This is particularly the case for anastomosing rivers in temperate regions. For a long time confused with bordered rivers, anastomosing rivers are defined as a type of low energy river situated in low gradient floodplains. These systems consist of multiple interconnected stable channels separated by vegetated islands. Nowadays, an inventory has not been taken yet, even if these are relic river system with a high heritage value. However, some of anastomosing river were recently studied in Central Europe. These studies indicate a gradual degradation of the anastomosing pattern and their conservation became a major challenge. It was thus great to discover on the Sharon River on the Atlantic coast, a zone of nearly 100 kilometers long having preserved an anastomosing pattern. Until few years, the anastomosing nature of this river was unknown by geomorphologists and Ivan Model Management Institution. This study focuses on the section between Angoulême and Sainte. Within the section, the Sharon River shows a shift of fluvial pattern in the vicinity of Cognac, a discontinuous and weekly anastomous pattern on the upstream section, and a predominant sinuous to meandering single channel on the downstream section. The fluvial landscape is marked by a high anthropic pressure, notably since the last three centuries because of navigation on water mills. Nowadays, the lack of knowledge on the anastomosis makes it difficult to develop conservation strategies in a context of climate change and high anthropic pressure associated to agriculture and new anthropic uses. These observations raise questions about long-term evolutionary trajectory of low energy rivers and how they have respond to past environmental changes and will adapt to future ones using the example of a Sharon River. The primary aims are to one, constrain hydroclimatic and anthropic factors that um, can be um, that can be um, driving forces for Sharon rivers changes over the last 300 years using an analysis of geohistorical data. Two, document short-term changes in the fluvial landform of a Sharon River in response to environmental variability over the last 150 years at the level of two spatial scales, fluvial segment on fluvial islands, using a multi-temporal statistic quantitative analysis conducted on four historical maps. Understand the long-term evolution of a Sharon River in response to environmental changes on the last millennium on two study sites using geophysical profiles, core data and bathymetric survey coupled with a LIDAR analysis. 
Reconstruction of a recent evolutionary trajectory of a Charente River shows a global stability of landforms fluvial from 1,866 to present. The anthropic factor seems to have played a key role in the global permanence of anastomosing pattern in midterm. According to geohistorical data, engineering works for commercial navigation, water mills, and flood protection seems to have strong local impacts but limited global impacts. The main objective of these engineering works was to improve navigation, but not a massive simplification of the anastomose pattern. However, this global stability doesn't mean that the river has remained unchanged over the last 150 years by focusing on the river islands, which are the most dynamic component of the anastomosing river system. Subtle trajectories of change can be highlighted and quantified. If a quarter of the island identified on 1,866 map remains unchanged until now, the remaining three quarters are affected by evolutionary process over this period. If this evolution particularly concerns the anastomosing section, that changes are however not uniform over space and time. In the earliest period, the anastomosing section experiments a pattern simplification as the dominant process is island disappearance. This simplification occurred over a period marked by several 20 year return period flutes, which may have played a key role in reducing the complexity of the anastomosing. During the next period, the river pattern experiment a high dynamism phase marked by the creation of new islands, the division of former islands, and the disappearance of some of them, leading to a global anastomosing pattern complexification. The driving causes of this evolution are both natural and anthropogenic. Increase of current flood on the one end and decline of river activities on the other. Over the recent period, the changes are more complex to decipher. Globally, the Sharon River is experiencing a period of stability, but also a local simplification of the anastomosis. This local evolution could be correlated to the increase in the number and duration of summer low water period and to new management practices following the renewal of river navigation. In order to complete the historical data, field works were also performed on paleo channels on island, particularly on the Angeac Sharon site. The study site was chosen because it presents a highly developed anastomosis with a very high concentration of paleoform and strong archaeological potential. The objective of this fieldwork was to characterize the stratigraphic organization of the islands, identify the mechanism of island construction on dead paleo channels indicative of simplification of the anastomosis. Geophysical profiles show a coarse formation interpreted as an ocean formation inherited from a braided system on the city clay filling corresponding to the recent alluvial plain of low thickness caused by anastomosing paleo channels. Field data suggest a fluvial metamorphosis from a high energy braided system to a low energy anastomosing system, which may have occurred around the end of a plenty glacial based on chronological data from French Atlantic rivers. This anastomosing section persists to the present, but in a degraded state. The current anastomosis will be a relict river system on the Angeac Charente. Radiocarbon debt suggests the simplification phase of the anastomosis around the second half of the subboreal, affected particularly the secondary channels. This simplification phase coincides with the first indication of Neolithic anthropization identified on the catchment. Uh, but also, this evolution could be a uh, local translation of a global rapid climate change, such as Iron Age Cold Epoch or 4.2K events, according to radiocarbon dates. However, this first interpretation will have to be refined by supplementary, sedimentary, and chronological data. Uh, this study raises question about future evolutionary trajectory of the anastomosis of the Sharon River and how it will adapt to climate change and new anthropic uses. Local simplification of the anastomosis question because, because this type of evolution could increase in the short and mid term under the effect of climate change and increased water withdrawal for agricultural purposes. 
The river is currently exposed to several summer low water periods, becoming more frequent and longer, which could lead to the disconnection of a small anastomosing channels. As a result, this study highlights several key management issues, limiting the clogging of anastomosing channels, encouraging the activation of recently abandoned channels, and finally promoting the creation of new channels by uh, leaving the root blood gem. However, these issues of management of the anastomosis question their compatibility with the issue of new river activities. This study highlights lines of research that need to be studied for improve global knowledge on the functioning of temperate anastomosis on the local knowledge of the Shawant River. We can mention notably the measure of effect of summer low water period on the local knowledge of the Shawant River. We can, we can mention the study um, we can mention also the study of uh, vulnerability of anastomosis to climate change and the impact of flow obstacle. And finally, uh, the study of a potential impact of riparian vegetation and its implication in management and uh, preservation of its type of low energy multi-channel rivers. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks, Susan, for, for the introduction. So I'm moving away from like classic geomorphology and going into a bit of ecology. So um, as you all know, the ecology of um, glacial environments is, is tricky because glacial environments are harsh. And this harshness is due because of high rates of glacial uh, sediment supply and glacial melt. And this too creates um, events of continuous bed reworking which basically means instability. And on, on, on top of that, you have high turbidity and low water temperatures. So we can say that the, the, these environments are dominated by disturbances, which basically means that the mounting communities, and in this case, periphyton, which is basically this layer of algae and, and organism growing on pebbles and grains and streams, the biomass of periphyton is extremely low during the summer because of disturbances. And it peaks in, in fall and spring because the disturbances progressively um, attenuate. But independently of the biomass, which is one thing, uh, periphyton develop in glacial floodplains. And in this research, uh, we wanted to understand the drivers that control uh, periphyton development. And, and this particularly because uh, in these two review papers, um, periphyton are thought to promote uh, vegetation development through ecosystem engineering, particularly because of sediment fertilization and stabilization and water infiltration reduction. So basically, there is more water flowing at the surface if purified and develop. However, um, these two papers were reviewed, so we wanted to corroborate the hypothesis made in these two papers. Okay, um, my research was focused on this small floodplain here, the floodplain of the Otama Glacier in southwestern Switzerland. So I'm not going to explain a lot of that because there is this nice blog written by my colleague Floriana Misen and my supervisor, Prof. Stuart Lane. Uh, there's everything about Otama, there's everything about the researches we have carried out up there. So if you want to know a bit more about this, this place, just visit this, this blog. In my case, well, I flew many times drones. I crashed many drones um, with the aim of decrypting the physical habitat of fairy fighting. Um, and then in 2021, we installed flims uh, to decrypt, to, uh, to decrypt, to investigate the periphyton ecosystem engineering. And I'm not going to talk about the methods today because I think the results are much more interesting. So if you're interested in the method, just drop me an email or go through the papers associated with this research. All right, so the first thing, we mapped periphyton development over an entire melt season. And what this map shows is the number of days periphyton was occupying a specific place of the floodplain. 
And, and basically what we, we found was that periphyton development was restricted to the hedges of the floodplain. And there, periphyton developed preferentially. In the center of the floodplain, periphyton did develop, but for very short periods of time. And so we started to ask ourselves why. First, we again, we, we understood uh, with our data that the center of the floodplain was very unstable during the melt season. So basically every day there were events of stream that they were working, while on the hedges, uh, the floodplain was 100% stable. And this instability versus stability was driven uh, by the braiding um, dynamics of the stream. In fact, in the center of the floodplain, the stream kept changing, basically on a daily basis. Uh, as you can see from, from this image. While on the hedges, we had channels that were always there, uh, clear water channels that did not experience any uh, morphological or like hydrological modification. With this data, well, what we found was, okay, Purifyton developed on the hedges uh, because of terraces. Uh, and terraces create zones of geomorphic stability because they are found at a higher elevation as compared to the braiding system. And if these terraces are drained by hill slope fed sources, uh, such as cranial and erythral uh, sources, well, they become hot spots for periphyton. And also they are perennial habitat where periphyton could develop throughout the melting season. But what was going on in the center? Um, we found that basically braiding intensity uh, drove um, periphyton development in the center. And the higher the braiding intensity, the higher the likelihood of having shallower and less harsh channels, which basically means that periphyton could profit off short windows of opportunity where the channels were more stable and uh, with more light reaching the bed. But, okay, periphyton developed, but these were ephemeral habitats because in fact, the channels kept changing and so the habitat just disappeared. So this matters because in fact, if ecosystem engineering effectively takes place, uh, it needs time uh, because periphyton need time to develop. So we argue that Ecosystem engineering, if it if effectively exists, is restricted to to perennial habitats. And so we wanted to understand uh, this ecosystem engineering effect. So in 2021, as I said, we installed some flumes in the floodplain of Fatima, and we basically let periphyton develop uh, for almost 60 days. I will just present one flume here, but uh, it also applies for the second. Uh, but what we well, what we, we saw was that periphyton developed and progressively filled the interstices of the stream bed. It reduces the roughness of the bed. And these two things had the consequence of reducing the water vertical infiltration. And this matters a lot because um, proglacial margins are extremely well drained. And so water easily infiltrates into the sediment matrix becoming unavailable to vegetation. Purifyton develop, it cover the stream bed. This create like um, an impermeable layer and water stays at the surface so that vegetation could have a profit. And so in conclusion, uh, well, yes, the environment of pro the environment of proglacial margins is harsh. They're limiting the development, development of purifyton, but um, there are places where periphyton could actually develop. These places are terraces. Um, if there is water, of course, so it is eel slope uh, channels. And since periphyton could develop for long enough, uh, it could start to engineer the environment. And particularly, it, periphyton could increase the retention of water at the surface. And so, yes, uh, periphyton could, uh, in some ways, promote vegetation development. Um, and yeah, thank you for your attention. Uh, I think we have a lot of time for questions if, if you have any. So um, I'm going to speak about this uh, proglacial area as well. 
but uh, talking about sediment instead of uh, vegetation. So um, I guess that most of you are familiar with uh, these graphs, which shows the paraglacial cycle. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, basically what it says is that we expect a uh, peak in sediment discharge uh, right at the beginning of the deglaciation, so when the deglaciation starts, and then uh, we should ex expect a decline of sediment supply to time um, that goes beyond the, uh, the end of deglaciation time. Then there are uh, some peaks uh, in sediment discharge, which can be related to either rainfall extremes or uh, anthropogenic disturbances. Uh, however, there are many studies who, um, let's say, say, um, say that this concept is rather simplistic, because of course, uh, periglacial environment is very complex and uh, sediment uh, transport is not only uh, influenced by uh, water discharge, but also uh, we need to know about sediment supply and especially the connectivity between the different elements of the landscape. So uh, actually uh, the, the, the question is, uh, will sediment supply increase or decrease in future? This is still an open question. So here I'm, I'm going to show you a study from the Sulden uh, Pro Glacial area, Sulden Glacier which is located in the central eastern Italian Alps in the region of South Tyrol. Um, we have used uh, digital surface models, uh, which are available since 2005, and aerial photographs, which are available since 1945. Uh, here you have an example of the uh, difference in elevation uh, between 2005 and 2021. Uh, you see that most of the uh, changes, of course, have occurred in the glacial area uh, where uh, most of the ice has melted out. But you also see that many changes uh, can be detected uh, in the proglacial areas, especially into the channel network, but also along the moraines. So uh, because I have not much time in this talk, I'm going right to the results, <laughs> preliminary results. Um, so we have seen that moraines supply sediment either at a constant rate or sporadically through uh, landslides, which can be triggered by rainfall. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of this portion of the moraine, uh, but I can tell you the similar dynamics are also occurring in these locations. But also we've seen that the newly formed channels which follow the uh, glacial retreat and the reorganization of the fluvial system contribute to the redistribution of sediment and to the erosion of previously deposited material. This is occurring right in this location here where the channel that is coming out from this part of the glacier is oh, has melt first the ice and now is uh, removing sediment from the lateral moraine. Uh, but has also occurred in the past in these other locations and will likely occur in the future in this location. Okay, so I now move to this location, the, the Eastern uh, Moraine. Uh, you can see here an orthophoto of 1969, uh, where you see the moraine, the uh, lateral moraine from the Little Ice Age and the uh, uh, remnant of the dead ice that it is located in the, in the valley floor. Uh, what I, you, I want you to focus on are these two boulders here, which you can see uh, highlighted by the arrows, uh, which are standing on the um, eastern side of the moraine, and that you can also see in the uh, orthophotos of 2021, located here, and you see that the western boulders is now standing right at the crest, at the edge of the, of the moraine. So uh, we see that the moraine is uh, um, backward, so it's been eroded backward, it's been moved backward, and we can estimate the volume of sediment that has been eroded by this portion of the moraine, only the portion that is above the dead ice, and we calculated a volume of 30 to 40,000 cubic meter uh, of sediment. This value is in agreement with the volume calculated from the uh, DOD, so the um, differential DMs, since 2005, which show a volume of 12,000 cubic meters. So if we assume that uh, erosion has occurred more or less constantly over time, this yields a rate of 750 cubic meter per year. 
I have to point out that this volume represent the volume of sediment eroded from the moraine, but not entrained to the fluvial system. Because of course, if you see, sorry, if you see at the bottom of the moraine here, you see that most of the material has been deposited in this um, terrace, that which is now vegetated. So in this portion of the moraine, the material is not connected to the fluvial channel, while in the upper part here, it is uh, connected and the material that is eroded from the upper part can go directly into the fluvial system. So um, now in this picture, you see uh, evolution of uh, erosion and deposition through time uh, with a different uh, DHEMs that we have available for these uh, time periods. Uh, well, it's maybe a bit confusing, but what I, I want you to show is that, again, this portion of the moraine, where you see a lot of erosion occurring in the upper part, but also a lot of deposition in this uh, bluish color uh, that is occurring at the mm, moraine foot. And similar thing uh, that is uh, happening in this portion of the moraine, where you can clearly recognize this uh, fun shape uh, morphology at the bottom of the moraine. So um, even if the moraine is producing sediment, it, is, uh, it looks like this sediment is not being delivered to the fluvial system. So in the end, what should we expect for the future in terms of sediment yields? Well, I now show you the, um, the, the, the profile of this channel ridge here, which you can see here. Uh, well, what is um, visible in this, in this uh, picture is that you see in the lower section of the profile uh, shows a convex shape, which is supposed to be uh, in equilibrium with the water and sediment discharge. So when a river is in equilibrium, we uh, expect that it has this uh, shape, this convex shape. But the upper part of the river uh, shows a very straight profile, meaning that it's not in equilibrium yet with its uh, water and sediment supply. And of course, this is quite normal because the upper ridge has been only recently uh, freed from ice. So it is normal that it's not yet in equilibrium. Now, if we look at the cross section along this channel ridge, uh, we see that most of the adjustment, so the upper ridge, A, B, and C, is uh, adjusting through lateral erosion. So now you see it in uh, black is a 2005 profile, and in blue is 2021. So you see that most of the erosion occurs at the, at the, slow, at the banks of the, of the channel, meaning that the river is eroding the moraine at the foot. So um, now if we want to uh, see what should we expect for the future. We know that moraines will continue to supply sediment, either in a constant rate or through sporadic events, but we will have an increase in channel and moraine connectivity because of this lateral erosion and channel adjustment. So at the end, we should expect an increase in sediment entrained in the fluvial system. If we want to have a visual uh, visualization of this concept is that while glacial is retiring and channel, channel is adjusting, we can have secondary peaks of sediment discharge, which follow this glacial retreat and, um, and channel uh, morphology adjustment. And of course, this adjustment can also occur once the glacier is completely disappeared. But then we will have to argue uh, how the changes in water discharge can uh, affect the morphology of the channel. Okay, I hope it uh, been clear. And if you have any question, please go ahead. Yeah, hey everyone. Um, so as Susan just said, I will talk about global patterns and trends of glacial lake outburst floods. But before I dive right into this topic, I want to give you a quick definition of what a glacial lake outburst flood actually is and why we care about them. So glacial lake outburst flood, also called GLOF, is basically just a sudden release of water from a glacial reservoir, but there are actually different types of glacial reservoirs, and I show you two of them here, so ice dump lakes and moraine dump lakes, and the reason why I'm showing those two types is because I will talk predominantly about these in my short presentation. And yeah, so ice dump lakes here on the left are basically just uh, water reservoirs dammed at the surface by the glacier body. So for instance, by 
uh, in a side valley of a glacier, whereas moraine dammed lakes here on the right are lakes that form after a glacier retreats and this creates some space behind the moraine of the glacier and then the water can be trapped at this barrier. Um, so as I said before, there are multiple more lake types, but they all have something in common and that is that they can burst out and have quite catastrophic consequences uh, for society, but also for geomorphology. So unfortunately, um, these floods often lead to the loss of life, but also the resettlement of entire villages, then economic losses, but also infrastructural damages, for instance, hydro uh, instance uh, hydropower plants, which are quite important in uh, many mountain regions at the moment. And then, of course, we also have geomorphic and ecologic impacts because these floods sit on top of the flood regime, uh, usually with extremely high peak discharges and can cause heavy erosion and deposition, and thereby can also have impacts on the downstream ecology, for instance, by causing the die out of uh, the local fish populations. And on top of that, we all know that we are experiencing global warming at the moment, and in most of the mountain region, this leads to glacier retreat. And there actually have been some studies that uh, had a look at the effects on this glacier retreat on um, glacier lakes. And a study by Sugar et al. 2020 found that there actually is a global increase in glacier lake volume by 48% in just the last three decades. And we can also see that here on the right, um, that this is one lake in Nepal and it's actually extending towards the glacier body with, which is retreating here on the side. So we see that these glacier lakes globally increase in volume. So the question we ask ourselves is, are there any temporal changes in globe magnitude? And to have a look at this, we constructed a database out of literature and web sources and added some mapped outburst area change to capture the most important information about location, date, outburst characteristics and impact. And we also have an online version of this database. So if anyone is interested, please look at this uh, website. Uh, but now just let's jump to the first results, um, which is the spatial distribution of those lakes uh, that actually um, cause outbursts. So here we have again the two lake types I've mentioned, ice dammed lakes in light blue and moraine dammed lakes in orange. These little dots here are all of uh, outburst locations and these bigger bubbles are the regional, is the regional percentage of each uh, lake type that causes outbursts in each region. And these numbers here are the number of reported outbursts we captured in our database. And the first thing we see is that actually the majority of report are the most, um, Gloves were reported in Northwest North America, uh, but we all, what we can also see in this graph is uh, that in Scandinavia and Northwest North America, um, most of the gloves occur from ice dump lakes, whereas in high mountain Asia and the Andes, we see mostly gloves from moraine dumped lakes. So let's actually have a look at the flood uh, magnitude. So in this case, flood volume. So this is a graph of the flood volume in million cubic meters on a natural log scale between 1900 and 2022. Here we have our two uh, lake type classes again. And let's first have a look at the moraine dammed lakes. And we see that these flood volumes actually show a comparably high variance when we compare it to the ice dammed lakes. But what we also can see uh, when we look at the trends, which are actually here indicated with the lines, um, these are just linear regressions, uh, we see that they do not point in the same direction for each area. Uh, however, we see that there are quite large confidence intervals, but what we take out of this is that we don't see an overarching trend for moraine dent lakes. And actually people already have been thinking about uh, what can cause um, the flood volumes of moraine dump lakes to shift or what might be the difference between the study regions. And one uh, point that came up is the outburst mechanism. So the way these floods are initiated, which is also of course dependent on the conditions, for instance, of the moraine dam or the surrounding of the lake. But we don't see that on a global um, trend yet. So let's continue with the ice dump lakes and 
you can see, first of all, that the volumes of these floods are usually higher than the ones of moraine and lakes. But what we also can see when we look at the trends is that in all of the study regions, we see, see rather a decrease in flood volume with time, which is actually a bit surprising when we think about, OK, we saw an increase in glacial lake volume on a global scale. But when we think about it a little bit more, that might be related to glacier mass loss, because a lot of these lakes drain uh, by flotation. So they float up the glacier body. When a certain pressure is reached, the water ex escapes. And then these lakes might drain again in the future. And when the glacier dam is thinning, because we see glacier mass loss, uh, that might limit the storing capacity because less pressure might be needed to lift up the glacier again. So we wanted to have a look at this uh, at different Iceland lakes around the world, but I will just show you one example here, which is Hidden Creek Lake in Alaska. And what you can see in this graph is, first of all, the lake area between 2000 and 2019. And we see that the lake was progressively decreasing in size actually by 45% between those two years. And what we can see too is that in the same time, uh, the glacier was thinning. And uh, so we thought it might be good to try to bring glacier thinning in relation to our reported flood magnitude parameters, which are flood volume and peak discharge. So these are actually the regression slopes of uh, two different models between glacier thinning and flood volume and peak discharge for different lakes around the world, which you can see up here. Uh, so positive values here would, for instance, mean continuing glacier thinning uh, would cause, or and at the same time, uh, decreasing peak discharges for this part of the graph. However, we see that it's not really consistent here. So we see a lot of um, disturbances. Um, so we concluded that there is only a moderate correlation between the glacier thinning and the reported magnitudes we observed. However, um, our what we took out of this is that it is, of course, much more complex. Uh, so for instance, some lakes drain through subglacial tunnels, uh, which are formed during their first outburst. Then they refreeze in winter again. And then also maybe less pressure might be needed to reopen that tunnels again. But there might be further reasons we want to have a look at. So to conclude this and sum this up, uh, so our data basically showed that bluffs from Iceland lakes decreased in magnitude while moraine and lakes had high variability. But when we look at future perspectives, it's quite clear that ice lakes will become fewer. They already do because they are bound to the existence of glaciers while moraine and lakes increase in the number and size. And to give you just a quick uh, outlook, what we want, plan to do in the future, so we saw that these magnitudes are changing, but we are not sure on a global pattern what does it mean for any geomorphic processes. So that kind of relates to Sarah's talk. Um, will we see more or less sediment transport from these uh, outburst floods? So, yeah, thanks for your attention. So good afternoon. My name is Simon Kainz. I'm a doctoral student at the University of Graz. And I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to talk about the role of thermocast processes in the initiation of alpine debris flows or debris, debris flows in permafrost affected terrain. So this talk will first introduce you to a sequence of events that hit an alpine valley in Tyrol about three years ago and then go on identifying the most important mechanisms that were responsible for initiating this sequence of events. So what happened? On August 13th, 2019, a thermocast lake that had developed on top of a rock glacier rapidly drained and initiated a massive debris flow. So the thermocast lake, which is indicated in blue in the photograph, had started to develop several weeks earlier on top of an active rock glacier that is indicated by the yellow highlighted area in the photo. An active rock glacier is basically a slowly downslope creeping mixture of ice and debris. And after several weeks of development, this lake drained within a couple of hours, so basically within one day, and initiated this debris flow at the rock glacier front, which is shown in red and uh, thereby displaced about 
50,000 cubic meters of sediment that rapidly traveled down the steep slope below the rock glacier front, spread out, crossed the valley axis, blocked the main river running along the valley, and impounded the lake of about 120,000 cubic meters of water. During the following days then, there was an excavation channel dig to, to prevent the potentially catastrophic outburst. Now, the interesting thing here is that it is not so clear what caused or what initiated this process chain. And to get an idea about this, we started um, looking for potentially destabilizing factors that initiated these events, analyzing them or first grouping them into these three groups, predisposing factors that, um, that describe the static setting in which the landslide occurred, then preparatory factors that slowly shifted the slope in a state made it susceptible to failure and triggering factors that actually caused the failure then. Uh, we started by evaluating each of these factors individually to identify the most important drivers for debris flow initiation and then went on assessing critical combinations of these factors to reconstruct the debris flow mechanism. Uh, we did so with the overall aim of being able to assess the hazard potential of these active rock glaciers, because rock glaciers are really widespread phenomenon in alpine landscapes or permafrost affected landscape, and therefore might be critical in this sense. And uh, the next couple of slides will now take you through the most important of these identified factors, starting with the topographical setting. So the debris flow initiated at the rock glacier front, which is steep, which means, of course, shear stress is a high, sensitivity to liquefaction is high, all the material that is eroded at the front, and there's a lot of material eroded because the, the slow movement of the rock glacier down, down, downhill is approximately balanced by the erosion rate at the front. And all these loose sediment is available for mobilization further down the slope. It does, it does not form a stabilizing cone at the toe of the front. So this is obviously already a kind of metastable situation. And next interesting thing is if we have a look at the thermal ground conditions at the debris flow initiation zone, which is given by the black circle, we see that it is at the lower boundary of permafrost here, which means that presumably there is some water content or high liquid water content in the pore space that a lot of sediment is already unfrozen and therefore loose and available for mobilization. And if there is some ice present, that it might already show quite high ductility. Um, it looks like there was actually some ice present. If you have a look at the upper two of these photographs taken several days after the debris flow initiated, especially at the upper right, you can see this overhang, which is formed by frozen debris, indicating that some ice was present at the time of debris flow initiation here. Next, we analyzed the grain size distribution of the rock glacier front and the results are depicted here. We found out that it is pretty poorly sorted, basically consisted of sand and gravel. And if, if you compare it to typical debris flow material indicated by the gray dashed lines here, you see that the distribution seem to match kind of. And this is important because this loose material is known to respond by in a contractive manner to shear stress meaning that if the pore space is saturated with water, then um, there is the possibility, or then high pore pressures are produced, which are driving the debris flow movement, basically. So we went on analyzing the climate in the circ above the debris flow initiation zone. And basically, we compared the weeks and months preceding the debris flow to earlier years to find out whether there are some significant differences. Uh, we found out that while precipitation was pretty much around the long-term average in 2019, air temperature was really, really high in the weeks preceding the flow, which means that a lot of energy basically was available for melting of permafrost ice in the weeks preceding the debris flow. Now, if we're having a look at potential triggering factors, first we noted that there was a light rainfall event in the night directly preceding the debris flow. Uh, we conducted a frequency analysis comparing this rainfall events to all the rainfall events that had hit the circ above the rock glacier since 2012, which are indicated here by the gray dots. 
the event before the debris slide is indicated in the by the red dot. And you see that this rainfall event was not especially severe, neither in terms of intensity nor in terms of event duration. So, and if you compare it to the critical rainfall threshold for debris flow initiation in Tyrol, which is given by the black line, it also plots below the line. And then finally, we compared it to several rainfall events that are known to have triggered debris flow with other active rock glacier fronts given by the black dots. And we also found out that our rainfall event here was way lower. So probably it was not the triggering factor. However, if we have a look at another potential triggering factor, the situation becomes much clearer. And this is this thermocast lake that had developed during the weeks before on the top of the rock glacier. And the red dotted line gives the extent of this lake one day before or immediately before the debris flow. And the photo was taken about one day later. And as you can see, the lake is almost empty. It had, it had drained within this one day, more or less. There's still some water left at the very bottom of the lake, but this is just really minor amount compared to the total volume before. And it's drained through this newly formed crevasse, which is massive in the rock glacier ice core, about two meters high, more than one meter wide, and forms part of a newly developed channel network. You can see here the collapse structures of this channel network connecting the position of the former Thermocast Lake in the southeast to the debris flow in the initiation zone in the northwest. So summing up, we have a couple of predisposing and preparatory factors that are not good for stability here. The front is steep. It, it's about 30 degrees, uh, uh, which means high shear stresses, potential for liquefaction. There's a lot of permafrost degradation going on around the initiation zone, and which decreases the shear strength, elevates the water content, and make sure that a lot of loose sediment is available, which is also made sure by the continued rock glacier movement. And this sediment also shows a bad or a, a grain cells distribution that makes it susceptible to debris flow initiation. Regarding the triggering factor, it's likely that the thermocast lake outburst above, although it was 300 meters behind the front, was um, the main triggering factor here because it was able to supply water at a rate of several cubic meters per second and developed very rapidly during this summer. So what did we learn from this? We, we see the rock glaciers really pose um, multi-hazard elements in these alpine landscapes because of their steep fronts, the large amount of sediment available, having a instable or a susceptible grain cells distribution and because of their changing internal structure. And in this specific situation here, we see that groundwater flow was actually governing slope stability at the rock glacier front because of, because of this rapidly developing channel network that had the capability to transport large amounts of water within a short time along these channels and because the storage capability provided by this thermocast lake on top of the rock glacier. And the critical thing for risk assessment or hazard assessment is that the reorganization of these water flow paths within the rock glacier happened on really, really short time scales that were on the order of weeks, which makes it really difficult to predict these kinds of events. Thank you. Go yeah, ahead. thanks for the introduction. Um, we move a bit up slope where the material comes from. And if you think about frost cracking, you always think about, okay, a temperature regime that enhances weathering. And there are a few scientists that try to pinpoint where this uh, regime could look like or could be. And uh, Hallett and colleagues there found out a regime between minus six and minus three degrees on a very low strength barrier sandstone. Robert Anderson developed a model where he said the frost cracking window, who, he was the one who established the term, lies between minus eight and minus three degrees. But if you um, use one of the most sophisticated models to model ice pressure and frost cracking by Ward and Hallett and apply it to westerly granite, you see that the frost cracking is between minus 20 and minus two, and it depends a bit on the initial crack lengths, so of rock properties and also the freezing duration. So what my question is, uh, when do rocks crack in, in alpine environments? And the second is, if there's some frost cracking window um, existing, 
cannot see it in the landscape, cannot see it on the mountain. Is there like an elevation range where these temperature conditions are, um, are there? And is this uh, elevation range like a hot spot of erosion? And can I um, yeah, prove this by data? So hypothesis one is, is frost cracking and alpine rocks temperature dependent? And hypothesis two is this frost cracking a main driver of the crumbling, so of the rock fall. To address hypothesis one, we took uh, some rock samples from a quarry that made up the main, uh, yeah, one of the major lithologies in the North Calcareous Alps, which is Svetashan limestone. And we put this uh, rock onto a water reservoir above a heater and we insulated all the sites and freeze the rock from top to bottom. And we got the temperature measurements or sensors um, in different depth of this rock and also acoustic emission sensors at the top and at the side. And we use acoustic emission as a proxy for cracking. The next step is what kind of thermal regime we want to apply. And these are all thermal regimes from uh, measurement stations or rock temperature loggers above 3000 meters or around 3000 meters. And you see what they all have in common at some point of time, they're below zero degrees. So they have freezing conditions. Some are fluctuating much more than others, like the Matterhorn compared to the Hungerli Valley, which is due to less snow cover at the Matterhorn and uh, more snow cover at the Hungerli Valley. We applied a uh, a temperature regime where we, which is more comparable to the Hungerli Valley, so we cool down our rock, keep the temperature constant at a, yeah, a steady temperature range, increase it, and a time again, another steady temperature range, in, increase it so it's a bit like step like. The reason why we do this is we try to exclude other factors than ice. So we don't want to produce thermal stresses because then we can't conclude if the um, acoustic emission numbers that we collect are really are connected to ice or to thermal stresses. The other thing that we need is uh, a thermal gradient. So we have cold conditions at the top and warm conditions at the bottom. So that we have positive temperatures at the bottom due to the heater and the water reservoir provides water that can move upwards and enable ice segregation. So we have an open system where water can move and can um, yeah, form ice lenses or grow ice lenses. Our data, you see we have temperature plotted against time and we reduce this temperature until, one, uh, until after um, phase one, then we increase it slightly to phase two, increase it again and so on. And every dot you see is a, a, an acoustic emission event. And the yellow ones are in, during the transition when we cool or warm the rock and the uh, orange one is during the um, steady phases. And what you see is we've observed a lot of um, acoustic emission when events during initial cooling. And then you see that the number of acoustic emission events decreases the warmer the um, cooling phase is. This slide shows um, the cumulative number of acoustic emission events. And you see that you have the largest increase and 95% of the events is during the initial cooling and during the first phases. We now try to find out, okay, what causes these events? We modeled a thermal stress that we try to exclude by our setup, but you see we have thermal stress when we change the temperature, so at the beginning or between the phases. So there we can't say if it's ice pulled up or if it's a thermal stress that causing this cracking. Then we modeled uh, the ice pressure, which is in orange, in four centimeters depth and in 15 centimeters depth. And as soon as we uh, froze the rock, the ice pressure built up. And if it crossed a critical threshold, which is rock strength dependent, the cracks in the rock will grow. And you see that the major growth starts at the beginning in phase one and phase two. And then we have no further um, growth, which is due to the ice pressure that this decreases because it's um, yeah, temperature dependent. And you see that this um, yeah, graph is very similar to the acoustic emission graph that we observed. So this is like our yeah, smoking gun that we think that ice pressure is the major contributor of these uh, acoustic emissions. If we now try to classify these acoustic emission events um, into temperature regimes, just like a Pallet and colleagues, we observed that the most uh, cracking occurred during phase one and two, 
and this is the majority and only very minor cracking uh, between minus six and minus one. So what we see or what we observe is the shift of the maybe traditional frost cracking window. And this is in our case because Wetterstein limestone has a much harder strength than Berea sandstone. But Berea sandstone is a, a, best, a sedimentary rock that will not make up alpine cliffs. Come to the second uh, part of the talk. If there is a frost cracking window, can we see it in our landscape? And for this purpose, we went into the Hungerli Valley, and what you see is a north-facing rock wall. The Matterhorn would be somewhere over there. We're in southern Switzerland. We have a small glacier, and the rock walls, they are ranging from 2,500 meters up to 3,300 meters. And the lithology is ranging from low strengths, uh, schistic quartzite, to high tensile strengths, uh, amphibolite. So we have a variety of um, lithology. And what we used was, uh, or what we collected first, was rock temperature. So we have five uh, locations where we collect rock temperature and record it for three years. And what you see is that the rock temperature decreases the higher I go. So you have more freezing at higher locations. And you see also that this uh, rock temperature is highly affected by snow cover, which uh, increases also the duration with increasing elevation. And we use this rock temperature to run a frost cracking model that incorporates strengths, which is a model by Rample and colleagues. And what you can see over here is the first that the magnitude of frost cracking is different depending on the lithology. So you observe a higher frost cracking rate if the uh, rock has a low strength and lower if it has a high strength. And the, uh, the plot shows um, frost cracking against elevation, you see that it increases until we reach a, an elevation between 2,900 and 3,000 meters, and then it decreases again. And what we now suggest that we should observe more rockfall in this area. And you see this are rockfall volumes derived from terrestrial laser scanning for like three years. And every you know, circle is um, an event, and the circle size refers to the event volume. And you see that, yeah, yeah we can see a, a clustering over there. However, the scanned rock wall area differs a bit. So we try to normalize the rockfall volume by the area and by time to get a rockfall uh, erosion rate. And if we calculate this, you see that the rockfall erosion rate increases with elevation. And you find that the yeah, highest rate is also in the area where we observed the highest frost cracking. It stays high and then it decreases. So it fits quite well, not perfect. However, you see, okay, we have also other factors that can play a role, like a glacier that has a certain size, but was not always as big as in the picture, so maybe bigger in the past. And what we do, we reconstructed the glacier size, and then we normalized the rockfall by the area deglaciated in a certain period. So we have 28 years, 72 years, and so on. And we um, plot erosion rate against elevation again, and you see that the highest rate are, uh, are achieved in the same elevation range because it's recently deglaciated. Also, permafrost can play a role, and we model permafrost distribution, and 95% of all these rockfalls were located in permafrost terrain. And we normalized the, the rockfall volume by the area with a certain uh, permafrost temperature, so with mean annual rock surface temperature. And you see also, if you plot this against elevation, you have an increase of the erosion rate and the highest peaks are around yeah, it's between 2,900 and like 3,200 meters. So to sum it up, you have maybe a connection between frost cracking and erosion rate, but also other periglacial processes or periglacial processes can play a role. And Usually, you have an, 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 a mountain environment where you have high frost cracking, but in, it's also an environment affected by a glacier retreat and permafrost thaw. To answer our um, hypothesis, so obviously, is one frost cracking in alpine rocks is temperature dependent? I would say yes, but the temperature range is strength dependent and seldom between minus eight and minus three degrees. So, if you want to model it, you need to include lithology. Hypothesis two is frost cracking a main driver of crumbling of rockfall. I would say maybe frost cracking is one driver, but you have other drivers as well. And, it, and there is no smoking gun that shows, okay, frost cracking is the 
major controlling factors. So if you want to model um, erosion rate, you should include other processes as well. Yeah, thank you for your attention and looking forward for your questions, which there are probably in the chat. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Alessandro Pedrini, PhD student at ETH at Zurich and a research assistant at SUBC University of uh, Applied uh, Sciences and Arts of Southern Switzerland. Um, today I present a study part of my PhD in which investigate the role of the deglaciation on the rock slope uh, stability. Hereby I describe the new insights uh, of the chronology of the large rock slope collapses in the Southern Swiss Alps. The investigation of the slope deformation subsequent to the deglaciation is of current interest as we are observing an increasingly rapid glacial retreat at global scale and consequent exposure of slopes that may fail and generate collapses which may endanger local uh, communities. So the question that arises is, uh, can the study of the slope deformation in former paraglacial environments help to know the behavior of the deglaciated uh, slopes in the next uh, centuries? For uh, assessing the connection between glacial retreat uh, and the occurrence of slope uh, collapses, uh, detailed uh, geochronological assessment of both uh, phenomena is uh, essential. The Southern Swiss Alps, meant here as the northern uh, valleys of the Canton Ticino and uh, adjacent valleys uh, of the Canton of Grabunder, are an interesting region to study this correlation because um, the phases of the glacial retreat after the last glacial maximum are well known thanks to the numerous radiocarbon data of uh, organic matter and uh, cosmogenic nuclide of uh, erratic boulders and uh, several deposits uh, of uh, rock slope collapses have never been dated with the exception of the Chironico landslide known to be one of the largest uh, crystalline rock avalanche in the Alps. So in this re research, uh, this research aims to define the age of exposure of deposits of uh, rock slope collapses and uh, relate the results to the deglaciation to obtain a morphodynamic uh, interpretation. Um, now a quick view on uh, how the Southern Swiss Alps could appear during the last glacial maximum. Uh, the valley floors were covered by more than 1000 meters of ice that left only the peaks emerging uh, as uh, known attacks. The region after the last glacial maximum was uh, characterized by four main uh, interstadials, intercut by stadials of uh, uh, known extent. And uh, a rapid glacial regression has been identified uh, between the Cuniasco and uh, Biasca stadials where uh, in less than 600 years, uh, the glacier had uh, regressed uh, of about 30 kilometers uh, upstream. Nowadays, the region shows a large number of uh, rock slope collapses with uh, volumes of uh, even millions of cubic meters. Uh, given the cosmic number of uh, deposits to be dated, we choose an uh, inexpensive and uh, rapid method, the Schmidt hammer, already used in this region to reconstruct the dynamic evolution of uh, rock glaciers. Um, the method consists to attribute to each rock slide deposit a strength value and uh, relating it to an exposure age. The strength value is obtained through the use of the Schmidt hammer, which consists of uh, a cylinder with uh, an internal spring that loads a tip. The tip is thrown against the rock and uh, the instrument gives a rebound value that is inversely proportional to the state of rock alteration, so uh, the age of uh, exposure of the rock. The requirements to apply the method are a common 
morphoclimatic context, uh, common lithology, and uh, at least two deposits of uh, non exposure ages. Uh, the exposure age can be obtained by a regression line correlating uh, exposure age and the rebound value. In green, you can see the exposure age of the deposits of rock slope collapses, and in blue, the exposure ages by cosmogenic nuclide uh, dating. Uh, we studied uh, the deposits uh, of seven rock slope collapses with uh, variation of block size and block uh, number. For uh, deposits uh, with um, large blocks, we obtained more impacts per block. With small blocks, uh, we tested a larger number of those with le less uh, impacts per block. But uh, in both cases, we've, uh, we made about uh, 500 impacts per block. Um, the regression line is then outlined by linear regression between beryllium-10 exposure age of the Chironico rock avalanche deposit and the beryllium-10 um, exposure age of uh, erratic blocks. Uh, these constraints are optimal because the lithology of the deposits is uh, similar and the age difference is uh, of thousands of years. And in addition, uh, we tested a query block recently block broken, which uh, gave a mean error value of uh, 63. And the 1513 Monte Crinone rock avalanche deposit, which gave a error value of uh, 58. And these data are a further evidence of the relationship between uh, exposure time and uh, error value. Um, here we compare the age obtained with uh, Schmidt-Hammer dating and the age of uh, deglaciation per site. It is possible to observe uh, three clusters of age of collapses. And uh, the rock avalanche of Centena, Ludiano, and Norantola took place immediately during the deglaciation and represent an early paraglacial response. And uh, the rock slope collapses of Bodio in Ticino Canton, Bodio Cauco, and Chironico uh, represent a few millennia delayed uh, response to the deglaciation. And if we consider also three rock slope deformation fell in historical times, Monte Crenone, Sassorosso, Preonzo, or not yet collapsed, it is possible to observe a third uh, cluster with a very long. Uh, delay more than 14 millennia after the deglaciation. Uh, flanking the graph of the sedimentation rate of the alluvial flood plain of the Ticino River Delta, we find here above, and the graph that puts in relation the age of collapse and the volumes of the deposits, we can make some observations. Uh, it seems not to be a direct correlation between volume of the deposits and time after uh, deglaciation. And the abundance of rock slope collapses following the deglaciation is in accordance with the sedimentation rate of the alluvial flood plain. The possible absence of large collapses during the Holocene thermal maximum until, until uh, historic uh, times. And, uh, an increase in the rock slope collapses during the last uh, millennium. So um, for what uh, I shown, I can draw the following uh, conclusions. Um, we observe relation between the age of uh, rock slope collapses and the sedimentation rate as both follow the paraglacial uh, erosion model. In our data, there is no direct uh, relation between the volume and the age uh, of rock uh, slope collapses. The same can be said for the relation between the age of uh, the collapses and the time of the slope exposure after uh, the deglaciation. But remain some open questions. One is about the relation between the ice thickness above the slope and the subsequent uh, rock slope failure. And a further question could uh, be about the investigation 
of a relation between the, the glaciation rate and the age of the slope collapses. So uh, thank you for your uh, attention. If you, uh, you have uh, questions. Thank you so much. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. As you may know, landslides are among one of the most significant uh, natural hazards across the globe responsible for up to thousands of fatalities every year worldwide. And even if most of these fatalities occur uh, during high velocity landslides, Los slow moving landslides are, are a significant source of concern for local populations as they continuously impact important infrastructures such as agricultural assets, houses, and roads. For this reason, it is important to study them, but also because studying slow moving landslides can actually lead us to a better understanding of the physical processes that cover uh, both slow and rapid landslides. And that's why today I uh, will be uh, talking about the potential of long-term monitoring of slow-moving landslides, specifically in Lower Austria. I'm Alejandra, I'm a PhD student from the University of Vienna. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction of the slow-moving landslides. These are uh, processes that creeps at rates of millimeters, uh, from millimeters to meters uh, per year. They are normally occurring at mechanically weak, uh, rich clay content soils, and they're characterized also by a complex subsurface hydrological system that contributes to these um, to non-uniform spatial and temporal kinematic behavior of these processes. The, relevan the relevance of slow-moving landslide studies is because based on different examples through literature and through, of course, examples that have occurred in the past, it, demonstra it was demonstrated that actually uh, slow moving landslides can transition into fast uh, moving processes and also cascading hazards can actually occur within these uh, landslide bodies. Therefore, uh, slow moving landslides can actually be identified as early deformation signals before landslide with catastrophic effects occur. And even though this is already demonstrated to different case studies, um, there is the slow moving landslides are constantly overlooked due to the high amount of time and resources that are necessary to study them. In the case of Lower Austria, this is a region that is characterized also by a high complex geology. Uh, the, this is a region that corresponds to a complex transition zone between uh, different units, specifically the Flish zone, the Clippen zone, and calcareous units. Uh, the Clippen zone and the Flish zone are geology geological units characterized by a high um, heterogeneity and high contents of clay that makes it makes them very susceptible to the occurrence of landslides. These processes along uh, some socio socioeconomic uh, developments proper of the region, such as agricultural development or construction urbanization, uh, make the region um, very uh, in high risk to uh, the impacts of these processes. Therefore, it is important to study what could be the potential impacts of these processes in, the, in this region. However, there's still a lack of understanding of the uh, frequency intensity relationships and triggering mechanisms, mechanisms of, this, of these processes in the area. And therefore, that's why uh, my the research group I'm part of, the Engage Group, uh, carried out a long-term monitoring project called the Noise Like Project to investigate landslides in Lower Austria since 2015. This was with the objective of understanding the controlling and triggering factors of landslides to estimate the potential risk for population and infrastructure, and to implement new methods for landslide analysis. All of that with the main goal of contribute to the resilience of local communities through the co-development and implementation of disaster risk reduction measures, such as a potential implementation of our early warning system in the area. 
And that's why we have three study sites in three different uh, landslides in Lower Austria. We have the Hofer Mühle study site, the Sarger study site, and the Brandstadt study site. In each site, we have implemented, carried out different uh, surface and subsurface methods, such as surface yard, laser scanning, surveying, UAV surveying, geomorphological mapping, dynamic probing, percussion drilling. But also we have installed on the field a meteorological station, piezometers, inclinometers, and TDR sensors. Today, because of the amount of time, I'm just going to show you some results from our most recent study site. This is the branch that landslide. This is a complex deep seated landslide whose depth is assumed to be at 20 meter depth uh, from um, calculated from the uh, estimated from different geophysical analysis in the past. Uh, in the last year, we were able to install uh, five inclinometers, three piezometers, um, TDR sensors, and a meteorological station there. In addition to that, we were we did some dynamic probing um, a percussion drilling to have a better understanding of the sliding material. So based on the integration and the analysis of the data we came up, uh, we were able to identify three main things. First, based on the observation of the digital elevation model and on the UAV data, it was possible to detect different geomorphological features that indicate us different patterns of movement. So we were able to identify uh, different, like several active areas uh, that have a, bit, a different distribution from the general landslide. That was, um, then we were able to compare those observations, those, those superficial observations, with subsurface information from the inclinometer data. And then we were able to see through the inclinometer graphs that you can see uh, here, which represent the cumulative displacement in depth. Then it was possible to observe that actually the, the, the inclinometers are, the, um, the slope is moving at different rates in different parts. So you can see in the inclinometer A, uh, the cumulative displacement is 10 centimeters in seven months. The inclinometer P has uh, shown a displacement of one centimeter in seven months, while the inclinometer C and B uh, have shown only less than half centimeter in the same period of time. So this actually confirms us the non-uniform spatial distribution of these processes, and also the indication of that there are different shallower processes occurring within the deep-seated uh, landslide body. Also, um, uh, considering the most active uh, part of the landslide body that corresponds to the active area close to the inclinometer A, we were able to take a closer look and we were able to confirm that there is not only a uh, spatial non-uniformity, but a temporal non-uniformity. When you have uh, different periods of activity, we, you have several moments where the process disaccelerates and some others when it accelerates. And this could be potentially linked to changes in groundwater level and for consequently changes in port water pressures mainly explained by precipitation and snow melting processes. So in general terms, <laughs> long-term monitoring is a useful tool that provides us important information for landslide analysis. We were able to confirm this non-uniform spatial and temporal landslide behavior of these slow processes. Also that branch that landslide, the recent study site, correspond to a complex landslide in which uh, we have shallower processes within the deep seated landslide body. However, it is still necessary to improve our understanding of the forcing and mechanisms of these processes to define the critical combinations that could give us idea of what could actually trigger accelerations in this area and therefore to estimate the potential impact of those hazard scenarios. So as perspectives, what we want, what is the next step? The next step is to use the information to integrate it into a better conceptual models that could be used for numerical modeling to actually be able to simulate these non-uniform uh, changes that could give us information of potential hazard scenarios and therefore that 
we could use to estimate the potential impact of those scenarios. Also, another perspective is to be able to integrate uh, into those models the anthropogenic influence. This is something that we would like to do in the future. And also another perspective is to, is to use artificial intelligence to be able to identify the critical combinations and what could actually cause acceleration of these slow moving processes in our study sites. Thank you very much. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, stop me if you can see my screen or can't hear me. Okay. So thanks for the opportunity to present the work here. Um, I will start with a question uh, about could um, very large and very old, can be thousands of years old landslides be destabilized by uh, urbanization and how it could. And in this case, it's particularly about informal urbanization. So what I'm going to show you here is kind of as analysis of how a very large landslide uh, behaves over time and how this behavior changed uh, alongside um, its urbanization over a 70 year time period. Um, it's great, I can be very quick about explaining what slow moving landslides are. Um, those are typically deep seated, so it can be hundreds of meters deep, they can be square kilometers in size, they are quite a big part of the heat slope which moves. Um, and what's quite nice about them is when you analyze uh, the dynamics of the landslide, so its velocity and change of velocity over time, you can understand quite well about the mechanism of the landslide, so how its slopes behaves and what controls the motion uh, and the mechanism of those landslides. Another part, which is, I believe, quite important here is um, we are working in the tropics. Um, <clears throat> and it's quite important because uh, it's a very landslide prone, uh, it's typically landslide prone areas, uh, well being quite overlooked in the literature. Uh, landslide prone because of two main aspects, natural, natural environment. Um, we have typically high uh, total precipitation, high intensity precipitation. We have high temperature over the entire year. So it's meaning we have uh, weathering of the rocks, which is quite deep. Um, so alteration of the rocks, which reduces the shear strength of the rocks. and make slopes uh, more landslide prone. Alongside that, you have uh, quite major um, demographic um, and economic change, which are sweeping aco across uh, tropical landscapes. So you will have um, urban expansion, agricultural expansion, which, which will change um, the uh, land cover, which may also induce the occurrence of more landslide. So you have what we call the high uh, natural landslide susceptibility in many places of the tropics. And alongside that, you also have quite high population density and high social vulnerability. So you have a lot of people living in an area where you have a lot of chance to have landslides. So a lot of um, hotspots of population exposure to landslide are located in the tropics. Alongside those, all those points, um, I Pick the same same figure as uh, the previous talk uh, from a quite nice review, which analyzed uh, our understanding of slow moving landslides. And here shows um, some of the key sites from which our understanding of the mechanism of landslide comes from. And you directly uh, situate where I want to go. Uh, most of them are located in high income, high latitude countries. So most of our understanding comes from, for instance, landslide in the Alps, where environmental conditions are quite different from what you can have, for instance, in Central Africa. So here we are working, uh, we'll be working in Central Africa in Eastern Euro the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the border uh, with Rwanda. We are uh, south of Lake Kivu in the city of Bukavu. Um, it's a 1 million inhabitant city, um, so quite densely inhabited in a landslide prone area. And you have today about one third of the city which is built on landslides. So not all are active. Um, all landslides are here that in, in, in red. And one is particularly active. It's outlined in yellow. This is the uh, landslide called, that we call Funu. And this will be um, the one we will be focusing on today. So this is Funu landslides. Um, you see Bukavu, you have this landslide is probably thousands years of years old. It clearly precedes um, human installation in the area. Um, but today you have about 80,000 people that lives uh, on these active landslides. 
it's quite large, 1.5 square kilometer, 90 meter depth. Um, and um, what we will do here is focus at two different scale, looking at um, short time scale, uh, quite with high temporal uh, resolution, analyze all the motion dynamics of the landslide today, or with OTIS, thanks to um, satellite imagery, but also look um, over change over time. So how dynamic of the landslide evolved alongside its urbanization. So let's, for, let's first have a look at short-term controls. Um, for that, we use SAR interferometry. Um, we are in the tropics, so it's first you have persistent cloud cover. So it's difficult to rely on optical uh, satellite image, but you also have, um, it's in situ uh, measurement are quite uh, complex to obtain. It's difficult to maintain instrument and install them in the area. So we could rely on SAR interferometry. It worked perfectly. Uh, what we did is to combine um, two sensor, Cosmos Kymet and Sentinel-1, which is quite nice because we could um, quite increase quite a lot our uh, temporal sampling. So we have one image every two days. What you have here are three figures uh, showing the formation uh, over the city of Bukavo, with on the left the east-west displacement uh, component, in the middle vertical displacement component, and on the right uh, the north-south uh, displacement component. You directly see you have one hotspot of deformation and that's uh, the Funo landslide. Inside it, you see you have different spots where you have higher deformation pattern. I won't go into detail here, but that's also quite interesting to see, um, to analyze the mechanism of the landslide and how uh, it changed. What I will show you is um, time series of displacements over time that we will compare to uh, pore water pressure. So you have displacements in orange, so vertical uh, 2D actually here, displacement of the landslide. It's an average or an internal landslide. And in blue, you have so the pore water pressure. Pore water pressure here simulates. Uh, what it is, it is a way to um, show the temporal um, gap in between the moment you have rain on the landslide and the time it, it takes to infiltrate within the slope. And so when it will actually change the slope stress state. Um, this here is simply simulated. We have no data on the ground. Um, what you see is that we have, um, so we can of course compare to rainfall from which the pore water pressure comes, but also earthquake occurrence. What we see is that it's mostly rainfall and so the pore water pressure that um, controls the overall motion of the landslide over time. We have lowest velocity during the dry season, um, highest velocity with the onset of the rain season, et cetera. This was quite expected. What was not is that this very large landslides, very deep, responds very rapidly to um, rainfall. For instance, at the end of the dry season, it will, in a matter of a few days with the first rains, you will have an acceleration of the landslide that we can catch here with the insert. And this was quite unexpected. So you have quite small difference in slope effective stress, which can drive uh, change in the landslide motion. So now we know that small change in effective stress can change the landslide motion. Um, how did it behave alongside um, drastic change um, that comes with urbanization? You have here a uh, picture more or less the same place over from the landslides on the left in 1959 and on the right 2018. You directly see that a lot changed on the slope. So we'll investigate that now. Um, here is historical aerial image from 1947, and we will go uh, forward in time. What you can see is the evolution, for instance, of the urban fabric of the landslide. Here, only the two of the landslide is urbanized. But if you go further in time, for instance, here in 1959, you see that uh, people start to settle more upslope, and it continues over time. This is 1979, 74, sorry. This is 2001. No, the entire landslide is urbanized. And when you go further in time, what you see is that you have an increase in the density of um, urban fabric within the landslide. What we did is to plot and measure the evolution of the urban fabric over time and plot that alongside the velocity of the landslide. And for that, we discriminate between two different zones within the landslide. I won't go to much into detail, but what you see is that we have uh, one unit that's moved faster, and this is unit. This unit was urbanized later than the other. So we have um, now here the evolution of the urban fabric over the landslide and the surface velocity. 
the unit that was urbanized the latest, it was urbanized in the 90s, it's upper in the slope. This was alongside um, dramatic, um, you had some conflict in the area, you have a lot of migration to the city to seek security. And alongside those migration, you had um, a very drastic increase in the population density or that area, which led to here at the same time, an increase in the velocity of the landslide. So why is that? Um, is it because of the weight of the building or something else? Uh, what we, uh, oh, long story short here, what we see is that we had a change in the surface, how the water infiltrate and drain in the water, in the slopes uh, alongside the urbanization. Think of building of drains, of roads, um, etc. And you had a convergence of the drainage over that area, which now moved the fastest, which see a difference, uh, which before was moving alongside the entire landslide, same pace, and now is moving fa uh, much fastest. Um, and so what we see is that it's a kind of feedback loop. You have convergence of drainage, so you have um, higher velocity or more infiltration over that zone, so you will have higher velocity. So you have, for instance, damage to the drain drainage which will further increase the velocity of the, that area. And so we have this central self-reinforcing feedbacks between the urbanization and um, the landslide motion. And so here, what we show is that we have an influence of the urbanization on the landslide dynamics. To finish uh, with some perspective, um, I have here some plots which show the evolution of uh, the population, which in which what's, what is particularly striking is the evolution of the urban population, no more than uh, half of the population lives in uh, urban areas. And this is particularly true for Africa and Asia, where most of uh, the future evolution is expected to be. And these countries, uh, you will have, for most of the area, you will have uh, those tropical environmental conditions that we describe here. And where, where, I show, where we show that we, we can have some uh, feedbacks in between urbanization, even informal urbanization, and the dynamics of a very large, old, and deep-seated landslides. That's it.